The mid-2000s were, by and large, one of the best timeframes the games industry has had. Even with the slight dip of 2006 in terms of general quality, 2004 to 2007 is chock full of games that, to this day, remain largely adored. The games I especially recall from this era tend to be first-person shooters. Bioshock, Halo 2 even though I didn't play this one until recently, Half-Life 2 even though I'm not a big fan of it, Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, Prey, and my favourite pure FPS of this era, Fear, First Encounter Assault Recon. Truly, this era is a bit of a cultural touchstone, with how the games industry changed rapidly and the games were great to boot. And if you were Sony or Microsoft, your home consoles were enjoying some huge success with tons of games that people played online. For Nintendo, however, things were looking a bit rough. The GameCube was starting to stall on its feet, despite a brilliant first couple years, whilst the PlayStation 2 and the Xbox largely romped away, and Nintendo even went to the trouble of giving the GameCube a revision, which reduced its capabilities somewhat. Its final years were somewhat tragic, really. It would still receive some unique games like Donkey Konga, which at least tried to extend the system's life, but it simply wasn't enough. Maybe a sequel to a now-revived franchise could help. When Metroid Prime launched in 2002, it sold very well for a Metroid game at the time, and is regarded as one of the greatest games of all time, and rightfully so. How about we take what the original did and do it bigger and better? Well, here we are. Let's dive into my favourite Metroid game. Metroid Prime 2 Echoes. Metroid Prime 2 Echoes, released in Japan as Metroid Prime 2 Dark Echoes, was a 2004 first-person action-adventure game, developed by Retro Studios for the Nintendo GameCube, as a sequel to the venerable Metroid Prime, which released two years before. Just as Prime before it, Echoes puts you in the boots of bounty hunter Samus Aran, as she heads towards the rogue planet Ether to investigate a horrific disturbance to the planet and the life on it, as Ether itself is torn in two. The game being a sequel meant Retro had some experience with the property now, and could work on the series in a way they felt worked best, albeit with some guidance from Nintendo to ensure they were staying true to the concept of the franchise. The success of Metroid Prime also enabled Retro to try out some new tricks to keep players on their toes and amp up the challenge, using Prime as a launchpad to make Echoes the game that would truly test the player's capabilities. There's also more of a focus on story compared to the previous game, which basically left you to it with occasional breadcrumbs here and there. In Echoes, you get cutscenes much more frequently, and even conversations, as one-sided as they may be. So, was Metroid Prime 2 Echoes the silver bullet to make the GameCube even more successful in a time that saw its competitors run away with their own solidly successful games? Was it a smash hit? Uh, no. Reviews at the time were very good, only a few points down on Prime for the most part, but the sales were not amazing and it was seen as a bit of a flop at the time, with only 800,000 copies sold by the end of 2009. Compared to Prime, which sold 1.5 million copies, in North America alone, this was a disappointment. Indeed, Echoes isn't as well remembered as Prime, especially given how much of a trailblazer Prime was at the time so it doesn't help matters that it kinda gets lost to time in many a conversation about the best Metroid games. However, as we go through this review, know that this is my favourite game in the entire series. Not just in the Prime Trilogy either, this tops even Super Metroid, my favourite of the 2D Metroid games. You'll learn to love this game by the end of this video if nothing else, and if you still don't, then uh, you can't say I didn't try. Anyway, packaging. Let's have a look at it, starting with the PAL box art, which is very different from the NTSC J box art, and it looks somewhat... okay. Samus's pose is one showing that she's preparing to attack, or maybe even firing her arm cannon. Other elements are, weirdly, carried over from the NTSC J box art of the original Metroid Prime, including the use of some UI elements. 
Also new on here is some sort of life form that isn't Samus, although who or what this being is we'll find out later. In any case, this cover art is serviceable. It doesn't look like it's going for many awards really, but I do appreciate the warning on the front saying that I'll play in 60Hz, and I'll like it. Japan would get something a bit different, something that I think is a bit less ordinary, and that is… well, it's a picture of Samus off centre, but her left side, so the right side of the box, appears very different, with a blue hue taking over that side of the box. The way the image is composed, it makes it look like something is taking Samus over, which leads to more intrigue, I think. It's something that makes it look like Samus might be in over her head with her current mission. What's fun though is the text on the box art. The stuff near the bottom isn't terribly important, instead I want to draw your attention to what's written on the side I made mention of earlier. Basically, I won't have to worry about working out when this game released in Japan. As for the back, it gives us a lot to work with here. A lot of imagery here, including more than just the life form we saw on the PAL box art. In fact, we also get this funky five-legged spider-like thingy. I think I'll call him Bob. Anyway, the screenshots are a touch smaller than they were on the original Prime's box, but the content are still solidly identifiable. You can see that there's a lot going on here, with all the screenshots and… wait, is th this multiplayer? Why yes it is! I don't have anyone to play it with however. Guess I'll just cry in the corner listening to Enya. Anyway, we peel off the skin for this game and we get to the flesh underneath, in the shape of a clear plastic box the contents of which consist of the disc and a manual, but there's also a pamphlet for Club Nintendo. Gotta remember this. For those who weren't there at the time, Club Nintendo was a reward scheme of sorts, where you'd get points to spend on products within an exclusive store, with things like wallpapers, ringtones, and even as grandiose as a golden statue of Link riding Epona. It would eventually be replaced by My Nintendo back in 2015, which itself has a few things available on the service, but the older service was more interesting in my opinion. It felt more unique in a way that I can't really easily explain. This is more talk on the thing I wasn't intending to hang around on though, so let's go into the manual which has much the same information as the original game's manual. Instead of a lot of orange however, we have a lot of blue in this manual. Once again, the content of this manual is written solely in Japanese, but at least there's a lot of images in the manual to draw your attention, so that you get the gist of what's going on here for the most part. What's also neat is that, occasionally for button commands, the manual will have a verbose explanation available to you, but also a simple instruction, usually a button on its own or with text explaining simply how it is used, which is pretty awesome. All in all, it's a pretty cool manual. Even if you can't read Japanese, you should be able to gather at least a little bit of info out of this, based on the simple subheading instructions that I mentioned just now. It's a pretty neat thing I'd say. Anyway, we've looked at the contents of the box for long enough, so how about we start playing the game? Let's get on with it then! Just as I did for Metroid Prime, I will be playing Echoes with Progressive Scan enabled, and similarly I will be setting the video settings much like how I did before. We load the game up and are greeted with some very moody music for the menu, and were thrown right into a cutscene that seems to be okay with outputting in progressive scan unlike the previous game, that's one improvement already. The main menu as well is much different to the previous game in that you use the analogue stick to rotate a sphere of sorts with spokes around it, corresponding to different options. Center a spoke on the screen and press A to accept, and with that, we can start the game. The game begins with a bunch of text detailing a mission notification for Samus Aran, our bounty hunter, indicating that she needs to discover the source of a disturbance on the rogue planet Ether. She plots a course for the planet and aims for the surface. As she does so, the planet seems to be fighting back with aggressive dark clouds and lightning strikes. The weather has its way with Samus' starship, and it is damaged on the way to the surface. It crashes into a cave system, but remains operational enough to correct itself for a proper landing. Samus emerges from the craft once it touches down, and with the craft engaging its automated repair systems, her only option is to press on, explore the vicinity, and investigate what happened on this planet. Yep, 
Your objective in this section is to re-establish communications to the Galactic Federation's forces on the planet. You see their crates and equipment all around here, but you also see a lot of creatures around here that may or may not have had their way with some of the crew. You progress through the caves and chambers to see if you can provide even the slightest amount of support, but it seems like the entire squad may have been wiped out or something. Scanning panels and activating systems allows you to power the area up somewhat to enable more progress, but once you do, something pretty bizarre happens. The Galactic Federation troops are taken over by some strange dark energy and are hostile to you. Things took something of a turn and we barely even started. Things take even more of a turn when we make our way to a seemingly empty chamber, but with the exceptions of a black figure that looks like Samus, and a purple device of some description. The black entity enters the device. Sensing little other option, we follow it to see if it teleports us to some place. And by all accounts, it does just that. This black entity appears to be doing something with a wall of phase on, while creatures hover around in ambush. Samus attempts to stand up, but a warning shot is fired. Moments later, however, Samus tries to make a move, only for this dark being to shoot the crystal right next to her, the effect of which sees Samus in dire trouble, as she starts to suffer damage from the atmosphere in this place. She has little option but to try and make an escape through the portal again. She succeeds, but the creatures ambushing her stole many of her abilities, meaning they are no longer available and you'll have to regain them as you play the game. The setup is very similar to Prime. It puts you in a situation that you know nothing about and must investigate before you discover some concerning events, which culminate in you eventually getting your toys taken away. There is one major difference here and it comes down to contrivance. The way Prime made you lose your abilities felt like a huge cop-out. The game making a weird situation out of nowhere, despite others being a more reasonable explanation for how you arrived at that point namely losing much of your arsenal. In Echoes, however, the game gives you a fairly cogent explanation. Instead of explosions suddenly making your weapons useless, Bruh. your weapons are physically taken away from you and you've to regain them. For now, however, we have to come to terms with the loss of some of our equipment and work our way out of this area to see if there is a way we can get to wherever the Galactic Federation forces landed before they were wiped out. On the way, we find a few things like a satellite dish, but activating it does nothing as the interference is just too severe for it to work. We press on, however, and find a ship with a lot of crates outside it and, quite concerningly, a few armoured corpses. Samus inserts her arm cannon into the terminal to see if she can glean any sort of data, and she finds a recording left by the soldiers just before the last had drawn his final breath in battle, outnumbered and outgunned, with a fleet of strange dark creatures. After looking around, you eventually find your missiles and can make your way to the next area, but not before being accosted by these same dark creatures that you saw in the video before. These things are surprisingly sturdy blighters and you have to take them down with some amount of caution. We manage to eliminate them, however, and we make our way out of this chamber and on towards a large towering structure. Inside, things look somewhat unusual, like this is a place of worship or a sanctuary. As we enter the atrium, however, we are accosted by some splinters, all of which get infected by this dark energy. Soon after, we find ourselves fighting a bigger one of these, which itself gets infected, but eventually, we take it down. After we've taken it down, a blue orb lifts out of the fallen splinter. We ponder it for a moment before we interact with it. It flies around, but then enters into our suit, which is unable to determine what exactly has worked into it. It doesn't appear to be dangerous, however. With only one open door available, we go through it and find an elevator that takes us further up into this place and into a chamber with a large machine in the middle. Suspecting something is off, Samus aims her arm cannon to the side and notices a life form in the wings. It introduces itself as Umos, one of the Luminoth, a race of moth people, that call Aether home and explains the situation to Samus. Something smashed into Aether a long time ago, causing the planet to change dramatically, as there are now effectively two Aethers, a light one and a dark one. With the creation of Dark Aether came the birth of a new race called the Ing. The Ing manifest in the world of Shadow and have tormented the Luminoth who lived peacefully on Aether for all this time, and because of the new Dark Aether, 
the planetary energy ended up split between both ethers. Umos explains the orb you absorbed was a device known as an energy transfer module, which you can make use of to drain Dark Ether of its planetary energy and return it to Ether proper, at each of the three temples that make up the explorable part of Ether. Umos grants us a translator module as well, and this will play a key role as we play through the game, as it determines where we can go and when. Beyond that, Umos instructs us to go to the Aegon Wastes to begin our quest of returning Aether's energy. You may have noticed that during the entire last chapter, I made no mention of the controls for this game, and the simple reason for that is that they are virtually identical to how they functioned in Prime. There aren't really any notable changes for the most part in the controls, and there's a couple reasons for this. Both of which will go into greater detail later on, but essentially it boils down to this game expecting that you've played the previous one, as well as having only a couple very different pickups. The controls are basically the same from the previous game. The analog stick moves you forward and backwards, as well as turning you left and right. The left shoulder button locks onto a target or a given point in the distance, and allows you to strafe and the right shoulder button locks Samus in place and allows you to look around. The A button fires your arm cannon, holding the A button down charges a shot that can be fired upon releasing it, B jumps, Y fires a missile, and X puts you into morph ball mode, and you can press A to drop a bomb in morph ball mode, which we're just about to acquire. The structure of this game is also much the same as it was previously, although there are a few differences which we'll get into later. For now though, Know that you'll navigate through some areas of the planet, all of different natures and styles, to sort out the problems the Luminoff are having. As we walk around the Aegon Wastes, our first port of call is with the energy controller in this section. But on the way there, we are accosted by a group of space pirates because I guess we needed these guys back. Still, where they roam, trouble often springs forth, and their presence on this planet is enough of a concern for us to want to do something about it. However, we have more immediate matters at hand, such as finding the energy controller. After a while, we find ourselves needing to combat a sandworm of sorts, and after a moment it gets infested with the power of the Ing, bringing us to a boss fight with a powered up version of this worm. Defeating this worm is merely a case of shooting its weak point until it's down, but we'll get into greater detail about the bosses when we get to them because, well, the boss fights are generally much better designed in this game compared to the previous. For the sake of comparison to the original Prime, Echoes makes it so that the boss encounters are more frequent, evidenced by showing a health bar for each one of these encounters, something Prime didn't do for some of its own encounters. After we get the Morph Ball Bomb, we can gain access to the Aegon Energy Controller by hopping into the bomb slot and dropping one. Once in the room, we can scan a communicator and from beyond the grave, we have our instructions from this area's guardian, Isha. Isha instructs you there is a portal room, a chamber which houses a portal that you can use to enter the shadow of the planet. On the other side, somewhere, is a dark temple you must gain access to, with the use of three temple keys found on Dark Aether. Upon departure, Isha gives you another translator module to access amber encoded devices. We make our way back from the controller and towards the portal room, where we are greeted with a puzzle to power up the portal and activate it. We have to deal with a few war wasps in the meanwhile, but after we provide enough solar power to enable the portal to activate, we scan the portal switch and walk on through to Dark Aether. As the portal spits Samus out, we find the environment to be rather dark and, for us, inhospitable. We're fortunate that we've landed where there is some light, otherwise we would have been in some nasty trouble, high lit, if you'll pardon the turn of phrase, by Dark Aether's atmosphere. This game is designed to make you feel like you're in danger no matter where you turn, especially in Dark Aether, where, with your Varia suit equipped, you take approximately 6 energy points of damage for every second you are not in the light. The game quickly instructs you, while you're here, that there are sources of light you can use to seek refuge in and restore your condition so as to avoid being suffocated by the heavy air around you. The main source of light comes in the form of light crystals planted by the Luminoff who endeavoured to end their suffering 
by taking the fight to the Ing to no avail. Crystals will always remain lit in this state. There are also light beacons, motes of light that can activate a dome upon being energised by a shot from your arm cannon, but they are temporary and will deactivate after a while. Both of these devices can also be affected by a couple other things we'll explore in due course. As you navigate these tricky wastes, you notice how oppressive this place is. Every enemy you encounter is some form of ing, or something that has been parasitically taken over by the ing. These can range from small creatures that don't take a lot of effort to take down at all, to larger enemies that require more firepower to defeat, and others that require methods obscure to all but the most omniscient of players of this game. You'll also notice some things in both Light and Dark Aether that are seemingly not there, like some bomb slots. This is an effect called Transdimensional Flux, where things are split between the two dimensions and are only tangible in one of them, but using them affects something in both worlds. You find your way towards a clearing with a single light crystal in the middle and some ridges up above that circle it. You're met by the Jump Guardian, an Ing warrior which took your space jump ability for itself and you have to take it down. In the end, you bring it down and stop it from stomping you into the ground and you regain your space jump ability, allowing you to jump in mid-air, which comes in quite handy. We find our way out of this chamber and back to the portal room and quickly say bye bye to this horror show. Being greeted by more space pirates when we return to the world that has no immediate need for light bulbs, we decide to make our way further into the area by checking it out now that we have the necessary equipment to make further progress. This is where we realise that the space pirates have quite the base here. Thankfully, unlike Prime where both times the locations they roamed were sprawling, in Echoes it comes back around on itself. Exploring this section provides us with quite a lot of different things to check out, include it. Oh no, they haven't, have they? They didn't just get the Metroids back again, did they? Yep, they did. One space pirate even fell into the feeding tank and became the equivalent of a footballer at a children's birthday party. Just with less broken glass and fewer tears. Oh yeah, we also have that copycat from earlier when our abilities were stolen from us. As we're trying to go one way through the space pirate's facilities, this lookalike locks us out using a couple gates, forcing us to go another way. Having gone the other way, we circle back around on the location that this being is situated, and it is doing something with Phazon, like what it was doing when we first spotted it on crash landing onto the planet. We find a hole where there was a window and jump down to it. This being, noticing us, moves away from its Phazon, and Samus, and as the game calls it, Dark Samus, begin a standoff with Samus aiming her arm cannon at her. Dark Samus fires back, and moments later, the battle commences. With this, you have a somewhat simple encounter with Dark Samus. Dark Samus's movements consist of hovering around the arena, and as it gets close to you, it strikes with a small area of effect attack. It also has the ability to nullify your lock-on as it quickly hops backwards after a major attack. It can also use itself as a projectile by charging up on Phazon and catapulting itself in a given direction. It can sometimes demolish whatever is in its path, although the central tank with the crystal in it remains unaffected. It is, however, pretty simple to take down, but as its health goes to zero and the battle ends, it goes out in a puff of Phazon, destroying some of the tank cases while it's at it, but no severe damage occurs. With Dark Samus defeated, we make our way out of this popsicle stand and find ourselves stuck as the gates cannot be opened for our passage. This is where we have to go into another room and find our first new beam, the Dark Beam. This is where we are introduced to a new mechanic to Metroid, Beam Ammunition. Unlike any Metroid game previous to this one, Echoes utilises a beam ammo system for all beams besides the power beam. Upon picking up the Dark Beam, you start out with a maximum capacity of 50 shots per tank, for Dark and Light Beams each. The latter beam being picked up when you go to Dark Aegon again here, with a charged shot consuming 5 ammo for the relevant beam. This is a somewhat controversial addition to the series, and although it was dabbled with at times in later instalments, 
Echo's inclusion of an ammo count was somewhat divisive, but I'm of the opinion that, given the nature of the weapons this system's attached to, it's a decent compromise. If you had the light beam, especially as early as you get it in the game, and had no ammo limit, it would be really busted. It's like how the plasma beam is the last beam you pick up in Prime or Super Metroid, because it's that potent. Another complaint I sometimes see is how you can run out of ammunition pretty easily. I personally never had that problem, simply because I'm laughably frugal with even the most potent of items. And the game already has a countermeasure, as you can charge a shot for that beam, and fire a single shot without needing ammo. The game also tells you the moment you get the light beam, that in order to get ammo for either beam, you defeat an enemy or destroy a cache using the opposite beam to the one you want ammo for. So if you want light beam ammo, kill or destroy using the dark beam, and vice versa. Much, much, much later on in the game, as in it's basically the second to last thing you pick up in the game, you acquire a beam which makes use of both light and dark ammo, the Annihilator Beam. Each shot makes use of one of each ammo, and a charge shot uses five of each. To explain the intricacies of the different beams, I'll reference Prime's own weapons, as the beams here are somewhat similar, but with a few differences. The light beam works somewhat like the plasma beam, and the dark beam works somewhat like the ice beam. The Annihilator Beam is different in this regard, as it's not really analogous to the Wave Beam as such. Instead, it homes in on its target for each shot, which comes in massively useful late on in the game when you're doing some item hunting. As for the effects of the different beams, the Dark Beam operating somewhat similarly to the Ice Beam allows it to freeze enemies in place, and using it as part of a one-two punch with a missile will often seal the deal in defeating certain enemies. The light beam similarly can be charged and fired towards a given target and incinerate it. The power of concentrated light is nothing to be messed with after all. On top of that, these beams have their uses in Dark Aether and on the Ying. Dark beam shots tend not to be especially powerful against the Ying. This isn't Dark Souls where you can use pyromancies on fire-based enemies, but they can have their uses. Light, however, is pretty potent against the Ying. A charged light beam shot can do some serious damage to an Ing warrior, but that's not the only use of the beams on Dark Aether. You know the light beacons and light crystals? Well, those can be affected by the different beams in the following ways. Dark beam shots can deactivate them and make them useless for a beast spell, unless reactivated with a light beam shot, which can also be used to supercharge a beacon or crystal. Alternatively, there is the use of the annihilator beam on the beacons and crystals. Its mixture of dark and light energy makes it heavily dangerous to the Ying, and kills them if it touches the dome. But the dark energy in it is simply irresistible to the Ying, and so they're doomed from the outset. The original Metroid Prime made use of weapons in a way that saw them have environmental purposes, with doors being opened by specific weapons, as well as some things that required you to use those weapons to deal with certain obstacles. The Wave Beam, for example, was used to activate electrical conduits in the event that you needed to power a door up in order to advance. This way, the weapons felt like they weren't just weapons, but tools with more of a use to them than simply defeating your opponents. The weapons in this game don't quite have that same usefulness generally, probably because of the ammo system, though there is still some of that in this game. However, it does make up for it by having more things you can make use of as you play through the game. Of course, Prime had its assortment of four beams, their respective combos, missiles, bombs, and power bombs to damage things. It was pretty straightforward and simple, and it works well enough for a game simply looking to take the 2D elements out of Metroid and translate it to 3D. Echoes, however, needed more, and indeed, there are a couple other elements that Retro Studios took from past games, but they also added in a few unique ones, and to investigate these, let's talk about missiles. Missiles in this game are much the same as they were in Prime, decent against enemies on their own, and can destroy larger containers to reveal their contents. They also work in conjunction with the beams as part of beam combos, all of which have their own uses and effects. Naturally, this super missile is the immediate one you acquire in Torvus Bog. It's powerful, using five missiles with your standard power beam, but then you also have the three other beam combos, and they are all really nuts in one way or another. We'll start with the Annihilator Beam's combo, the Sonic Boom. 
It distorts space and time with its shot, and it is powerful as all hell. The light beam's sunburst is also pretty powerful, incinerating virtually anything near it, and the dark beam's dark burst allows you to create a black hole that draws enemies in. Grizzly. There is still one thing that's more grizzly than that, however, and that is the ammo consumption. Whilst you only use five missiles with each super missile, the other beam combos are very expensive. As in, five missiles and 30 ammo of the respective ammo types of the beam. With that power comes some severe cost, and whilst you can recoup the costs later on in the game, it's arguable as to whether it's worth it. According to game designer Mark Pacini, the final boss was designed around the use of the sonic boom, although I don't often make use of it. As well as those things, however, missiles have another use in this game in that you can acquire a weapon that allows you to lock onto things with your missiles and target multiple things at once, the Seeker Missiles. Holding the right shoulder button down along with the Y button, you can use the analog stick to look around to check things out, and you can hover over targets to lock onto them. Releasing the Y button will then fire off a volley of missiles to shoot your targets out. This is useful for a combination of things, primarily taking care of a number of enemies in a single go, as well as unlocking the new purple doors that may curb your progress otherwise. Oh, and as an aside, there are now yellow doors as well for power bombs, which is cool. There are also some utilities for mobility. Prime made use of things like the spider ball and the grapple beam, and they return in this game, although the usefulness of the latter has been blunted a little bit, although not without good reason, as the spider ball is much more useful now, and there's a new toy to play with. In a far-off area in the Sanctuary Fortress, you can find yourself working to power four devices. These devices eventually unlock a cage of sorts to provide you with access to something that was originally going to be included in the original game, but never made it in. Here it is, the Screw Attack. It has a few main uses, with the most notable one being that it can be used to jump across massive areas, allowing for quick traversal of large ravines with little worry. This also allows you to wall jump on certain surfaces, which is cool. It's activated by pressing the B button, and you get five bursts of it before it's exhausted. You also need to be careful to not bump into something, otherwise it will pull you right out of it. And you need to make sure that you're heading exactly in the direction you're intending, otherwise it'll be a bit tricky to get right. The toys don't end there, however. The visor system returns from the previous game with a few new visors to work with, and improvements to one existing one. So let's start with the scan visor. In Prime, you had to find targets on what you wanted to scan. This was fine for a first attempt, but it had problems when it came to larger things, and it also meant that you had to scan things from certain angles. Echoes changes it by making the entire entity scannable. You simply aim for something blue or red, hold the left shoulder button, and you've got what you're after. It's also easier to see what you have scanned, as it turns green, and the game gives you a breakdown of the things you've scanned in-game as you scan. This is why I made mention in my previous review to potential arguments of hindsight, since I didn't play Prime until the very early 2010s, nor did I play Echoes until a couple years after Prime. It was, however, one of the main things I noticed between the two games. The other things that have changed going from Prime to Echoes was the kinds of visors you got. In Prime, you got the Thermal Visor and X-Ray Visor, whereas Echoes does things a little different. After taking down the second of the Dark Temple bosses, you are provided with one of the most important tools for completing the game, the Dark Visor. Simply, it combines the X-Ray and Thermal Visors to make a universally useful visor. Things that are invisible, usually because they're affected by dark energy, will show up in red. Where this comes in useful is for dealing with enemies like the Dark Pirate Commandos, where they have a habit of going invisible and moving around the arena as frequently as they do. It also comes in useful for something else we'll go into later on, but let's talk about the other visor. Navigating the Sanctuary Fortress, you'll find yourself fighting Dark Samus again. Yes, more than one time, and after defeating... It? Does Dark Samus have a gender? Uh, you're given a little puzzle with a reward at the end. The Echo Visor is a rather unique addition to this series, as this game makes use of unique audio cues, sometimes as a Luminoff security measure for certain devices. 
shooting the source of the sound, as shown by the echo visor, will eventually disable it. It is also used in tandem with the Annihilator Beam as part of puzzles where sounds correspond with a code that unlocks a door to a given pickup, usually an upgrade of some description. It's a really unique tool with some usefulness in battle as well, and with that, let's go into the boss battles. The original Metroid Prime didn't have many boss fights, and it was probably for the best. It was a first attempt that was relatively lukewarm, and although it didn't make the best use of its boss fights, they weren't awful, generally speaking, just not particularly great. Echoes starts much the same for a little bit, as the first few encounters are quite ordinary, as you get a few of your abilities back. The first Dark Temple boss brings you to a fight with Amorbis, which makes use of its arena to dive in and out of the sand. Eventually, it is taken down and you get a very important item, the Dark Suit. The Dark Suit effectively allows you to explore Dark Aether with a significant decrease in damage taken from its atmosphere, as well as a slight decrease in regular damage taken. Also, can I just say how cool the Dark Suit looks? Like, it gives me major steampunk vibes. I love it. So then, you're making your way through these boss fights like it's nothing, but when you get to Torvus Bog, the game guides you towards getting the boost ball back, and this is a major point of contention with this game, and by all accounts, this is a sign that this game is not just Prime. Metroid Prime was an unusual concept when it first launched at the time, and it was targeting a crowd that was probably unfamiliar with first-person shooters, and so decided to make the game a little on the easy side in some respects, although it does have a hard option if you wanted more of a challenge. Echoes, however, does more or less the same thing the Zone of the Enders games did, in that the difficulty at the start of the second game is on a level of the end of the first game. The idea of the game is well understood by the start of the second game, and so it can start to turn the challenge up a bit. The Boost Ball Guardian is one such boss. You have a relatively small arena in which to fight this boss, and there is no light dome in which you can restore your energy. You really need to get energy pickups from any ing that show up. This battle almost always sees me dying at some point. It's a pretty steep curve when you go into fighting this boss, which isn't helped by how relatively little stuff you can pick up at this point. But in the end, it's not actually as bad as most say, I reckon. By all accounts, this boss is very aggressive. You have to avoid being hit by it in its different forms, whilst timing your attacks well enough. It's difficult, but not so hard that it's punishing to those who are playing it for the first time. It just requires a little patience. And with the increase in challenge comes an increase in unique scenarios in which you fight bosses. Although I'm not the biggest fan of the Spider Guardian battle, it's a unique challenge that tests your agility in tighter spaces as well as your timing. Easily though, the best boss battle in this game is the Sanctuary Fortress's Quadraxis. It's a giant quad with a gigantic arena and amazing presence. It's very arguably the best boss fight across the entire franchise too, thanks to its clever use of many of the things you've picked up as you played the game. Quadraxis is a larger than life boss fight, and it's such a cool design. Chica is also a really cool fight, requiring quick aiming and agility, and whilst Amorbis is quite ordinary, it's fairly early in the game whilst you're getting yourself used to what the game expects of you, and still makes use of some smart challenges. Really, I think the boss fights here are a genuine improvement over the original game. Whilst at first the game eases you into them, they develop into something truly fantastic, and they don't squander the potential of the bosses in the end, compared to the previous game. I'd talk about the final boss at this point, but I won't go into that just yet, because there are a few other things we need to talk about. We need to talk about the presentation first, so let's get that out of the way now. Going from Prime to Echoes, the GameCube was maturing and was much better understood. Given Retro Studios developed Metroid Prime from a demo that was made before even having full access to official hardware, Retro would finally be able to put those years of experience to better use. Naturally, the first thing to talk about is the visuals, and by all accounts, things have improved quite a bit. Now, this is not to say the original game was ugly by any means. Indeed, whilst it looked a touch plain at times, it still had an aesthetic and style that worked for the atmosphere it was trying to build. Metroid Prime 2 Echoes, however, introduces a wealth of differences. The textures and models make up the bulk of the changes, really, where the fidelity is much higher compared to Prime. 
The models are more complex and have more polygons, whilst textures are higher resolution and more detailed. On top of that, in terms of visual direction, I find myself preferring this one over Prime for a few reasons. With Prime, I always found myself thinking that environmentally, things had a tendency of looking a bit flat despite having signs of being lived in. Echoes, however, makes it quite clear these places were lived in by a race of moth people with a circle fixation. The game makes use of circular iconography a lot, and it's signified in how circular this game's world's design is. Think of this game's world as being somewhat akin to a tetrahedron, where you have a central point with three regions that are connected like vertices to one another. It may not feel the most natural, but it's a smart way to make the game feel friendly to explore. One complaint I have with Metroid Prime, albeit a minor one, is that backtracking can be finicky owing to how out of reach certain places can be. Granted, Super Metroid also have this problem to some extent, but even then, Super Metroid's pace made it take relatively little time to get to your destination. Echoes makes it somewhat straightforward to navigate thanks to an elevator in every one of the areas you explore, taking you to different areas in a way that makes navigation simpler, and it helps that these things open up as you play the game. As for how the different locations look, they all carry very unique appearances and evidence of past events. It's really interesting to look at all of them as you explore them and take everything in, because whilst Metroid Prime's Talon 4 looks like it was lived in, Echoes' ether feels like it is lived in. A big sandy borderland in Aegon Waste paired up with facilities set up by the Space Pirates, a tropical and miry Torvus bog combined with the subterrane that feels like an underwater shrine, and Sanctuary Fortress's science fiction mansion all felt tremendously unique whilst never feeling desolate. Seriously, Sanctuary Fortress might be my favourite area in a Metroid game. I made a ton of comments on my streams of this game that I loved the design of the area. Lots of jagged edges, electronic upside down rain, something akin to a gigantic metropolis on the surface down below. It's fantastic. The visual style of Dark Aether too is really interesting. It is worth noting of course that for the most part Dark Aether across all regions looks closer to Dark Aether than just the individual equivalents in Light Aether, though this is by no means intended to imply they're not interesting. All things considered, Echoes takes what Prime did where the visuals are concerned and managed to make a world feel even more genuine, which is impressive given how much people love the original game's world. It also takes after Prime for its resolution and frame rate. Every single version of the game, even the PAL release, runs at 60 frames per second very smoothly, and still manages to look better across the board than the original Prime, and still keeps up the funky max resolution of 680x480. However, it isn't all sunshine and rainbows. Whilst this game looks a lot better, and whilst I said that the game plays very smoothly, there are some areas, such as certain doors at the Sanctuary Fortress, where the performance chugs harder than someone destroying a yard of ale. I guess when you push boundaries, something's going to try to push back somewhere. Thankfully, these instances of frame rate chugs are few and far between, and tend to happen somewhat consistently in certain places without cause for concern. Now that we've dealt with the visuals, I want to make mention of the audio side of things here. And you might think I won't have an awful lot to talk about, but I'm going to put it this way. This game sounds better than Prime in my opinion. When it comes down to it, my opinions can be summarised like so. The music sounds generally more like music rather than just being ambient a lot of the time. And it somehow builds up on the atmosphere even better than the original game. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves here, let's talk about the sound effects. The sound design was handled by Clark Wen, like the original Prime. And there are quite a few things carried over from Prime, but there are also some new things that show up here and there with regards to audio. This mainly comes down to the new creatures and enemies you encounter, such as the Luminov having something designed to resemble dialogue, as well as many of the Ing monsters. There are also some mechanical enemies in the Sanctuary Fortress to keep in mind. Ambient sounds are also added to here. The sounds produced by Sonic Locks, as revealed by the Echo Visor, have a cool tone to them, and the game makes good use of audio, especially given how it makes some considerable use of audio to begin with. Oh, and the sounds of War Wasps are back again. Wonderful. Now to talk about the music, because I really want to talk about this now. If you couldn't tell already, I adore the music in Echoes. K. 
Kenji Yamamoto returns to compose the soundtrack for this game, and this time, there's more of a musical tone to much of the music instead of mostly being ambient sounds. I realise this sounds like a weird thing to say to some degree considering virtually every game in the Metroid series is like this, but at the same time, Echoes does this in a way that makes the soundtrack pop out more, with a lot of stuff that is cool as hell to me. The music in the Temple Grounds has that choral tone to it that makes it feel a bit spiritual in some respects, whilst also sounding intense enough to suggest a feeling of adventure based on what's going to happen in the time to come. Sanctuary Fortress makes use of more overt electronic elements that help to make this location in particular feel almost like a cool spaceship. It really has that kind of vibe to it and I love it. Other themes include the atmospheric music that features in the Aegon Wastes, which works for the desert environment that you're exploring, as well as the Taurus Bog Subterrain, which features a rendition of the music that plays in what's known as Red Brinstar in Super Metroid. This is all well and good, but what about when the lights go out? The music in Dark Aether takes on a bastardised and mangled form compared to what is played in the Light Aether equivalents of the areas you're exploring, and the atmosphere goes from light and modest to bitingly oppressive very quickly. The music in these areas may take something that appears in the original music, like a leitmotif or a melody, and manipulate it in a way that makes it terrifying and surreal. I think a decent comparison would be the musical work of James Leyland Kirby, who you probably know better as one of his personas, the Caretaker. His works under the Caretaker name consist of a lot of sample manipulation, to turn the undefined yet somehow familiar into something grotesque, while still triggering a feeling of grasping at what you're listening to. The Dark Aether Tranks also ramp up the feeling of terror in that part of the planet. A whole lot of Dark Worlds in games can sometimes miss out on this trick, but Metroid Prime 2 Echoes took absolute advantage of ramping up the tension in this area. And speaking of tension, the boss music is fantastic in this game. This game genuinely has some of the best boss themes in the entire series, and I could seriously ramble on about them all day if I wanted to. Which is impressive given I'm not the most musically literate person in the world, but here we are. I'm gonna once again call on Quadraxis to make my point. It's the thumping, electronic piece with echoing choral pieces that truly sell just how potent this boss is. The boss is gigantic already, but the music makes it feel like something you'd see in Shadow of the Colossus. Also, it would be totally remiss of me to talk about this game's boss music and not mention the theme of Dark Samus for one simple reason. I loved it enough to use it as my channel's intro theme for a video or two back in the day. They're really old videos though, and I don't know which ones they were, so... And now it's time for something to drag us back down to Earth slightly and talk about something that isn't so great about this game, the Key Hunt. Yep, this game does basically the same thing as Prime, and some argue it's worse this time, but I'll explain a thing or two here as to why I don't entirely agree. In this game, not only do you need to collect three temple keys for each area in order to access their dark temple and fight the boss inside it, but you also need to find a further nine sky temple keys to access the game's final boss, the Emperor Ing, and by extension, retrieve the last of the stolen light on Dark Aether. The idea behind it is that around the different parts of Dark Aether, you will find certain Luminoth that are part of one of the two cadres of key bearers. These key bearers are always in an approximate location to where the keys themselves are. But when you look around, you don't actually see the keys anywhere. So what gives with that? Well, this is where we talk about one of the more commonly used arguments in criticising this whole deal and that is with how the game makes use of the Dark Visor. You see, by the time you defeat Chica and acquire the Dark Visor, you've completed over half the game already. You picked up beams and ammo, a dark suit and a whole mezze of abilities, and yet all of them are useless to actually get the Sky Temple keys until you pick up the Dark Visor. The use of the Dark Visor is necessary here, because when you use the Dark Visor, you may see a strange red organism on the screen. This is an Ing key cache, and if you shoot it, it overpowers the Dark Visor and forces you to switch back to the Combat Visor and destroy it, and boom, you've got a key. 
Now, I do acknowledge that this game does leave it quite late for you to start the quest. In fact, Prime allowed you to start collecting the Chozo artifacts the moment you landed on Talon 4, leaving it to you and it giving a few breadcrumbs on what to do in the areas you've checked out already. However, allow me to make the case that Echoes does this better, even if I do think that this sort of stuff is unnecessary all the same. It comes down to one thing, it's a far more structured system than the original game, and it feels a lot less like a crapshoot as a result. If there's one thing I didn't like when playing through Prime when I was younger, it was how the game gave you breadcrumbs that somehow still felt too vague to comprehend. I mentioned this in the review, but when I played Prime as a teen, I always ended up playing with a guide for the artifacts, because I was either a complete moron back then, or the game wasn't clear enough on where to go. With Echoes, you get the same kind of hints on where the key bearers are located at the Sky Temple entrance, but you also get the hint of the key bearers themselves, and if you use a dart visor in Light Aether, although you won't be able to do anything with it, you'll still get an outline of the key cache. As for the structure being more straightforward, allow me to elaborate. In this game, there are four main areas you explore, with three of them connected by a nexus of sorts. Because of this, the game sorts it out accordingly. Dark Aegon, Dark Torvus Bog, and the Ing Hive each have two Sky Temple keys to find, whilst the Sky Temple grounds have three of them to find. The best thing, however, is how every single one is in a distinct location. The Sky Temple grounds ones are always found at the dead end, effectively. You can't get lost finding these things, as there are so few places for you to otherwise go. The other regions tend to be split up in two as well, so finding the keys in a given location is a process of elimination in the end. I genuinely believe that for this reason, Echoes handles it much better than Prime. Circling back around on the complaint of getting the Dark Visor too late, I want to counteract this with saying that you go back to every single area for one thing or another anyway, if you're the sort of player who gets caught up in the feeling of picking every single thing up. There's a lot of stuff to pick up in this game, and chances are you were thinking of going back to the Space Pirate base in Aegon Wastes anyway. You know you want that beam ammo upgrade, so why not do a clean sweep now that you've picked up the Dark Visor and Associated Toys? I never quite got the feeling that others had that this forces backtracking, especially when I feel like that's what Metroid Prime was doing to begin with. As far as I'm concerned, Echoes is no worse in this regard, considering it pretty much nudges you to doing it by telling you, hey, you could pick some new stuff up too. I do, however, still think this whole pick up all the MacGuffins to unlock the thingamabob and defeat the doofus within thing is a bit unnecessary in the end. Whilst Echoes does this system better than Prime, I still think the game would have been much better off with omitting this completely and leaving it up to you. After all, with this game's difficulty, the training wheels are off and therefore it would make sense for it to trust you with your own ability. As it is though, it still feels like a guided tour to the end game. This time however, the end game of Metroid Prime 2 Echoes is truly fantastic. Once again, I'm making mention of what happens in the end, so if you don't want spoilers, skip ahead to the conclusion chapter. With the Light of the Three Temples restored, you acquire a brand new toy in your arsenal, the Light Suit. It allows you completely unadulterated mobility in Dark Aether, and getting around the need for Light Beacons and Light Crystals by making it so that you take no damage whatsoever from Dark Aether's atmosphere. It also means other things like the Ing Storm are not damaging to you anymore, and you can submerge yourself in purple Ing infested water to find the stuff you otherwise wouldn't be able to due to the water. After finding the nine Sky Temple keys and reuniting them in the Sky Temple's entrance, you can use these keys to enter the Sky Temple itself and be greeted with a spindly thing guarding a large red orb. It absorbs it and disappears into the ceiling, leaving you to find your way towards it. Using the screw attack to wall jump our way up to the door at the top, we go through it to find the large red orb is the last of Aether's light. We approach it, but the tentacles come back to annoy us before a large body forms and consumes the light. This is the Emperor Ing, a giant black mass comprised of a body resembling a pulsing tree trunk, 
a head that sort of resembles a licorice all sort, and tentacles that want to do a spot of paddling. The idea is you have to shoot the barbed tips of the tentacles and force them to retract. Once you do so, the head of the Emperor Ing will also retract, revealing the Emperor Ing's eye. A couple eyelids, I guess, guard the eye, but there's also a slot where the Emperor Ing is vulnerable. Eventually, you'll whittle its health down to a point where it becomes just a chrysalis. In this form, the chamber will fill up with a noxious substance that damages you if you end up on the floor, which will happen a few times based on what you need to do. On the chrysalis are little orifices from which tentacles will rip you if you stay there for long enough. But if you bring them out and drop a few bombs or even a power bomb, you can destroy them. Just be careful about the other ring that show up. Eventually, once you've cleared all the tentacles, the Emperor Ing hatches from its chrysalis to take on a spider-like form akin to the Ing Warriors. This time though, it's much more vicious and there's a lot of stuff to watch for. Its weak point is the mouth, but it will do a fair amount of things to make it difficult for you to even get a shot in. It does not like to make things simple for you whatsoever. You have to use all of your movement tricks to avoid being trampled by the Emperor Ing here, and where possible you need to make sure your ammunition is at a good level so that you can deal with the challenge that the game throws at you. It's a great culmination of everything you've learned. You finally kill the Emperor Ing, and as it dies to death, you go ahead and absorb the last of Aether's light unopposed. The moment you do, however, Dark Aether begins to collapse with no energy to sustain its existence any further, and the Sky Temple starts to fall apart. You need to get out of there immediately. The game gives you 8 minutes to leave, which sounds like a somewhat generous amount of time, given there's a portal right at the entrance. But there's the problem of it being completely walled off by Phazon. Instead, we are not going anywhere until we've taken part in one last dance with the skeletal form of Dark Samus. Appropriate that this is the final boss, all things considered. They raise their arm cannons and begin to fight one final time. This is a two-part fight of sorts, where you must whittle down Dark Samus' health as quickly as you can early on, for the simple reason that once you've got it down to about 75%, it's business hours. Every once in a while, Dark Samus will gather and energise a bunch of Phazon, and use it to direct projectiles towards you. They come in two flavours, however. There's the larger one that heads to you like a missile, and there's the other one that's more like a volley of smaller shots. The trick here is to gather the volley of shots in a charged power beam and to fire a phase on powered charge beam shot right back at her, them, it. Seriously, is Dark Samus gendered? Answers on a postcard. Dark Samus eventually falls after enough of these shots and staggers towards Samus. Samus's expression of petrified triumph witnesses Dark Samus's hand move towards the light emanating from the breastplate of Samus's light suit before Dark Samus finally dissipates and the Phazon goes away. Like an earthquake, the shaking gets increasingly violent, and the Ing are getting restless. You need to get out, and now that the portal is open to you, you simply activate it and jump right on through whilst the Ing try to get through it themselves. You emerge out of the portal like you were shot from a cannon at a circus, and as Dark Aether collapses, the Ing fail to get out through the portal in time and get consumed by oblivion. Dark Aether eventually dissipates, and the terror on Aether is no more. The Luminoth come back out of their stasis chambers, and as you emerge and return the light suit to them, the Luminoth salute you with gratitude towards your saving their race from absolute darkness. In response, Samus simply waves them goodbye, a small gesture with great weight. Once again, depending on how many items you pick up, you can unlock secret endings, one of which is simply Samus in her Zero Suit. I suppose anyone who's been in as stressful a situation as Samus has had to endure whilst her ship was undergoing repairs would need a bit of R&R after all. Now that Samus' ship has repaired itself, it can make its way out of the temple grounds, 
and away from Aoife onto its next mission, wherever that may end up being. Credits. This was said at the outset pretty much, but Metroid Prime 2 Echoes is my favourite Metroid game. It is also one of the games I cite as an example of the ideal sequel. It takes what Metroid Prime did before it, and it works on top of it in a way that feels like a genuine step up. Prime's existence allowed Echoes to experiment a little bit with what it could do especially in terms of difficulty, and whilst it can be argued that this makes the game's difficulty about as even as the Grampian Mountains, it still felt like a natural progression of what Prime left off with. Virtually every single thing in this game was improved in some way or another, or at worst altered in some way that didn't necessarily worsen it. The movement feels a little tighter, the scanning feels a lot better now that you don't have to find a particular target anymore, and it all just feels nicer to play I think. On top of that, this game is absolutely dripping with atmosphere. It's so thick and cloudy with atmosphere that you can practically breathe it. The original Metroid Prime had a great sense of atmosphere, but Echoes genuinely outdoes it in lots of areas, especially in terms of horror. Simply, I heartily recommend that you play this game. The trouble, however, is finding a version of the game that you can play, because whilst 800,000 copies sold worldwide is by no means a disaster, it did disappoint compared to the original game, which sold 1.5 million copies in North America alone. The Japanese release is probably the worst way to play it, too because quite apart from its language requirements, which don't really differ at all from the original game, copies of the game are not only difficult to get, but are also quite expensive. I was fortunate to basically get it for £30 as part of a larger order, but it's pretty much never that price anymore. Yahoo Auctions listings basically have it listed around 6,000 to 8,000 yen, which puts it at around 40 to £50 and that's before the costs of servicing and shipping via proxy services. There is another way, however. I mentioned this in the review of the original Metroid Prime, but there is the compiled release for the Wii called Metroid Prime Trilogy. It's arguably the best way to play these games as it converts the games to play with the Wii Remote and Nunchuck, but there's one thing to consider. One complaint often brought up with this game is the difficulty. This time though, there is a difficulty select at the start that allows you to play on an easier difficulty setting than the original release. So if you have trouble with this game, for whatever reason, the easier difficulty setting is available to you. You also get the usual creature comforts that you've got with the trilogy version of Prime, and in general it's the best way to play the game, and for as long as the Wii U eShop is open, I would advise that you get it. Physical prices remain absurd, however. So what followed on from this? Well, a fair bit. The next entry in the Metroid Prime series was actually a demo game for the Nintendo DS called Metroid Prime Hunters First Hunt, which released with select consoles as a pack-in. It wouldn't get a full game until a year later, where in the interim another game would release titled Metroid Prime Pinball. It's a simple pinball game for the DS, translating the progression of Metroid Prime to a pinball game somehow. Metroid Prime Hunters would finally bring the franchise's first person gameplay to the handheld in a proper title in 2006 for the DS, although its reception was on the slightly more than warm side. If nothing else, it's a decently impressive technical exercise. For 2007, there was a massive opportunity for the Metroid franchise to make its mark on the Wii, with a control scheme that was a perfect match. With that, Metroid Prime 3 Corruption would release and by all accounts, it was a very good game that made good use of the Wii in general. However, I won't be reviewing this game until, like, 2026, for the simple reason that it falls outside of my requirements for what I can review on this series. So to put it simply, it's a really good game, but compared to the previous two, it has some design decisions that affect it in ways that I'm not sure I'm fond of.
For a while after its release, Retro Studios had tended towards developing games using Nintendo's other properties, most notably the recent Donkey Kong Country games, and even co-developing Mario Kart 7 for the 3DS along with Nintendo EAD. However, a fourth Metroid Prime entry was announced back at E3 in 2017, with development from Bandai Namco Singapore instead of Retro Studios, with some figures like Kensuke Tanabe back working on the franchise. Development, however, seems to be troubled. Updates have been sparse, and in early 2019, Shinya Takahashi of Nintendo EPD, the successor to EAD, announced that due to disappointing progress, Nintendo would recruit Retro Studios to restart the project, bringing them back to work their magic. Since then, the little scraps of info we have received have either come from job listings for certain positions at Retro Studios, and what the position would entail. At the time of writing, we know very little about what Metroid Prime 4 will consist of, but I remain somewhat optimistic about it. We haven't been starved of Metroid games as of recent, at least. Metroid Dread released very recently for the Nintendo Switch, and it's one of the most highly praised games of 2021, and for a lot of good reasons. And yet, Dread was in a form of development hell itself. Here's hoping that Metroid Prime 4 does well, because whilst the development process seems to be rocky, given the past work done by Retro Studios, I don't doubt at all that they'll pull through in the end. That having been said, however, I could be very wrong and it could end up being Bioware. In any event, Metroid Prime as a series is fantastic, and Metroid Prime 2 is a fantastic entry in that series. It has everything I could want in a game, and then some, and it's one of my favourite games of all time. I genuinely recommend that people give this a shot, it's so good. With all that done, thank you very much for watching this waffle. I didn't quite get as many reviews done as I would have liked this year, but with 2022 on the horizon, I can't wait to see what comes out of it. At the time of writing this, I'll already have a good idea of what I'll do. With that having been said, if you have a suggestion of what I should cover, please let me know. On my website, in the description is my collection, which consists of quite a number of games, and I also have my wishlist for games that I don't yet own, but would like to. There is also my Twitter in the description if you would like to keep up to date with everything that I'm up to. Now that that's done, this has been Daniel Learmouth. Happy New Year, and sit. Wait a minute. We've still got to talk about Jeff Spangenberg! Oh god. Alright, so a little refresher. Jess Spangenberg was the founder of a number of studios in his time. He formed Iguana Entertainment, which made games like Chirok Dinosaur Hunter, but he was fired from Iguana by his publisher Acclaim Entertainment, which he sued them and got an out-of-court settlement for. Whilst this was happening, he approached Nintendo to form a new studio to develop games for the up-and-coming GameCube, called Retro Studios. They had a bunch of ideas of what they could make, including a car combat game, an action RPG, and a gridiron football game. In the end, Nintendo, spearheaded by Shigeru Miyamoto during dialogue, agreed to permit the team to develop a Metroid first-person game, something that would release for the GameCube and would be overseen by Nintendo themselves so that Retro don't stray too far from the original vision that had been set out. Retro Studios was lavish at the time. It was one of the first locations in Austin, Texas to have a motion capture system for animation, and it was decked out with state-of-the-art hardware for developing the games they would eventually make. This didn't mean things were easy, however. Development was tricky, and there were a number of layoffs that occurred from time to time for a number of reasons, including but not limited to inexperienced staff, technical issues, and, perhaps most notoriously of all, Jeff Spangenberg himself. By the end of the millennium, Spangenberg was rich. He'd made tons of money off of games he made at Iguana, and as some tales recall, in 2000 he arrived at Retro Studios after months of absence in a brand new Ferrari to inform everyone that some people were being laid off from their job. All the while, Nintendo were pouring money into Retro Studios, 
to just get something done. And this was at the stage where they were coming up with concepts more than actual games. The moment Nintendo saw what Retro was struggling with doing, Nintendo forced a change of direction with giving them the license to develop a Metroid game. This was by no means the end, however. Because when Nintendo caught wind of what exactly Jeff Spangenberg was doing in and out of the company, Nintendo's decision making was swift and exact, and it would be that Spangenberg was gone from the picture. Now, quite apart from laying off people after getting out of a new Ferrari after months of absence, Spangenberg had another problem, and that was his seemingly insatiable horniness. It was discovered that on retro servers, Jess Spangenberg had stored a lot of images of women dressed in swimsuits, assuming they were dressed at all, and even hosted a website distributing them. All this on company servers which conflicted with Nintendo's family-friendly image. Suffice it to say, Nintendo were done with him, and wanted him gone, and so in 2001, he would be replaced as CEO by Steve Barchia. And whilst the development process wasn't immediately smoothed out, if anything it got rockier for a brief while, at least the skeleton crew left didn't have an axe over their heads. Spangenberg, however, was not done with game development. In fact, he wanted to keep going and would go to the gathering of developers with the intention of forming another studio. And indeed, he would go ahead and do so. The trouble is, relatively little is known about the studio itself, and there has been basically nothing about Spangenberg on the internet after 2004. There's only been three images of him that I could trust were of him, and I used the highest resolution one of him without making him look like a lost member of a butt rock band. And there's a very good reason for this, considering the nature of the game he would release at his new studio. You see, it was bad enough that he hosted a website with pictures of scantily clad women on company servers. But what comes next truly puts the cherry on top. In 2004, Jess Spangenberg's new studio, called Top Heavy Studios, would unleash upon the world a quiz game for the PlayStation 2, Xbox and PC that featured girls in swimsuits, and getting the questions correct would end up with you getting the prize of these girls removing the tops of their swimsuits. But even more hilarious, all things considered, is that one of the girls featured in the game sued Top Heavy and the publisher as well as Sony and Microsoft, as the girl in question was not made aware of what she was being used as part of. And at the time of her being recorded for the game, she was 17 years old! The game had effectively been banned from all manner of things. It's illegal to buy or sell the game in some jurisdictions, and the cutscenes of the game were cut up from the game and put onto a DVD to be sold instead of the game to try and make back some money for the lawsuits, presumably. So, not only was he the man that founded Iguana Entertainment, which went on to make Turok Dinosaur Hunter, and not only was he the man who founded Retro Studios, which went on to make Metroid Prime, but Jess Spangenberg was the man who founded Top Heavy Studios, which went on to make The Guy Game. Happy New Year! <laughs>